Multiplayer games. We all know them, we all love them, and we've all spent way too much time and in some cases money on them. But how are they made? When you dissect a multiplayer game into the smaller pieces of an actual program, what is it? How does it work? What lets you join a world filled with other players playing the same game you are? Hi folks, it's Falcon. And today on Game Ranks, we ask the question, how are multiplayer games programmed? So obviously a multiplayer game is, you guessed it, a game. All of the normal game programming stuff applies to a multiplayer game. Essentially, it's a set of commands that run in a loop that generate different reactions based on different conditions. For instance, if you have an inventory item, say a key, and you try to open a locked door, it's going to act differently than if you didn't have that inventory item. As it continues to go through the loop of instructions, that's the thing that changes, and hey, something happens in the game. If this, then that. Essentially, a game continually performs computational logic. And while we could go further into that, we've done a lot of videos about how specific things in games are made. Just knowing that a multiplayer game is essentially written the same way, has a graphics engine, has physics, has shaders, etc., etc., at least at its base, allows us to discuss the specific things involved in creating a multiplayer game. Put shortly, we have to have a means to communicate between more than one game if we're going to have more than one person playing more than one game. Now, the most popular way of doing this at the time is a server client architecture. Now, I brought up all the computational logic, which then has to be shared between all of those players. In order to ensure that people are all on the same page, the server is the one doing the computational logic during the course of a multiplayer game. So there may actually be a little bit less involved on the client side, meaning on your computer, than if you were playing a single player version of the same game, but that's not necessarily a given. I have played games where it's very clear all of the computational logic is being done on the client side, because you'll have these random little things where everybody sort of syncs up and events didn't go as you might think, but I wanna stress that to the player, unless they have programming knowledge, including myself, it's very difficult to actually discern this, and it's not terribly important to understand what's going on. Still, good to acknowledge. So let's put it this way. On your end, you're playing a game like you would play any other game. But every single thing that you do has to be kept track of by the server. When you do something, for instance, let's say, let's say you make a kill. This causes an event handler to be invoked on the server. Now the game is essentially acting as an interface that is detecting input, and the handler is doing exactly what its name says, handling that input. Now, as a handler, it needs to make sure that all of the other computers, all of the other games, the clients that are attached to the server, receive information indicating that this happened. But what needs to happen for everybody to receive that information is they have to be listening for it. Not consciously listening for it, of course, that would be ridiculous, but embedded within the code are event listeners. These are essentially commands that are saying, if this action, then do this. The event handler changes the properties of the event listener, at least temporarily, and the event listener reacts accordingly. To summarize, anything you do has to be sent to the server, and for it to show up on every other computer, each computer has to be listening for when things happen. Now, there is a long list of event handlers and event listeners that go into the creation of a game and making it seem like a fluid, interactive experience. And some of these things even have to be created on the fly. Obviously, every player has to be identified so that their movements can be listened to. So you may have specific event handlers and event listeners created for each one of the players. There's actually a lot of different ways this can be set up. These are essentially flows of information, and it has to be organized, and part of the job of the programming team is to organize this. 
it's not just to write endless amounts of code, it's to funnel information that is brought in thanks to the players playing. Now, like I said, this is basically the most popular version of this. There are other ways to do multiplayer. There's peer-to-peer, -peer, which if you're familiar with BitTorrent, and I don't know why you would be at all, that's the principle that BitTorrent uses. Peer-to-peer -peer is basically a means to distribute the tasks and workloads of a computing process between all the various clients that are attached. In the case of a peer-to-peer -peer game, there is no server. Or you could even say it as everyone is a server. Every system attached to a peer-to-peer -peer network is operating as a server. Now, in terms of longevity, a peer-to-peer -peer network is obviously the one that would last much better because it doesn't depend on any centralized location. If somebody burned down the server farm in Iceland that Star Wars Battlefront 2 or whatever uses, some would say that justice is served, but either way, all of the players of Star Wars Battlefront 2 would immediately notice that there is no server. The game would not function at all. This is kind of why people don't like the always online thing for single player games. But obviously you have to have that for online multiplayer because it's online multiplayer. Anyway, this is probably why EA doesn't say where their servers are, knowing that in order to seek true justice, we would have to burn down all the server farms in the world and just use the process of elimination to get to the Star Wars Battlefront 2 servers, a task most would consider tedious and probably fairly expensive. That's an advantage of peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no way to burn down the server farm. Everyone is the server, and that means no one is the server. The disadvantage to a peer-to-peer -peer network, however, is that it is only as good as the weakest link. If you're distributing all of the workload between all of the computers, depending on how you distribute it, having a player with a bad connection could either mean that player has some sort of advantage or disadvantage, or if the workload is evenly spread, it would slow everyone down. Believe it or not, Destiny 2 uses a peer-to-peer -peer system, and it has turned out not to be liberating as it might sound. Players with bad connections act as a detriment towards everybody else in some way, sometimes negligible, sometimes quite bad. And that leaves us with an interesting question. It's the same question we often ask with most aspects of life. Do we want to spread everything out among the people, or do we want to centralize it? I would say the way our economic system works, for everybody to have a decent experience, it has to be centralized. But I'm also not saying the economic system has to stay the way it is forever, does it? I don't know. It's for people smarter than me to talk about. Peer-to-peer -peer would work much better if everybody had access to the exact same type of connection using the exact same equipment. It would be the obvious choice as a matter of fact. However, we don't live in a world that is like that. The server is provided to you as a service to a customer. And honestly, that's probably how it should be because you're paying the company money and your experience is kind of what they've been selling you. So for the time being, let's just assume that the right way to do it is a dedicated server, even though most of the stuff we've said in this video applies to both. As far as scale, it really kind of works the same way for everything. The basic building blocks I'm giving you here work for Star Wars Battlefront 2 in the same way that they work for World of Warcraft. The arrangement of the way this stuff works is usually a variable, but the object is obviously not specifics. It's to help you to understand what is going on under the hood at least a little bit better. If we want to talk more specifics, game devs and players alike, please gather in the comments and do so. If you like this video, please click the like button. And if you're not subscribed, now would be a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.